We've been doing a series starting last week on a reasonable faith. And that itself can be um, sort of a tricky idea, but I think it's important that we ground ourselves in uh, something more than just authority. Let me recap. I basically suggested last week that while the Seventh-day Adventist Church doesn't hold to all four of these, many traditional theologies have four legs or sources in the stool. One is authority, that is to say the scriptures that come to us as a word of authority. The other is reason. How do we think through our faith? What's rational about the way we look at our belief system? Number three, experience. How is it that our experience of the divine interacts with what it is that we think and what it is that we read in sources of authority? And lastly, tradition. What sorts of traditions have evolved through the church in such a way that they come to us as a source of authority as well? That they themselves become vehicles and uh, things that transmit to us ideas about who God is and who we are and who we all are together. Now, last week, and I'm not going to recap the entire sermon, you're free to look at that online, I suggested that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has traditionally had trouble with tradition because we don't want to see practices developed by ourselves or by human beings or by the Pope or by someone else as on a same level of authority with Scripture. So for a Seventh-day Adventist, the Scripture stands in authority as a unique kind of authority for us. Um, nevertheless, our theology implies a certain kind of reason. And we would all want to say that we're here because we've had a certain type of experience of the divine or we're curious or longing to have an experience of the divine. So uh, we have those legs, if you will, on our theological stools as we think about what it means to construct or what it means to have a faith that's reasonable. Now, at the risk of sounding incredibly dry, I want to try to make this come alive in some practical ways, though I'm very challenged time-wise today. Let me pull to the scriptures so that at least from those, we have something we can look at in terms of a balance about how we might think about the scripture in relationship to authority and our lives. That would be a, a starting point, point. And if I have time, I'll talk to you a little bit more about our relationship to the scriptures in terms of reason in our minds, because uh, there are many distortions, and I might be able to get to a couple of those. We'll see. The gospel reading is the most important one today because Jesus is speaking directly here in the book of John. John is his cousin, a great prophet, one who has foretold the coming of the Messiah, identified the Messiah. John is really a powerful figure in Jewish society at the turn of the millennium there. He says, Jesus, I have testimony more weighty than John's because I have the works that my Father has given me to finish. And here are the works that I'm doing. They are the works that testify that he has sent me to you. Now that seems sort of a circular kind of logic to us, but Jesus is saying, look, I have a testimony. The testimony is what I do, and what I do is to point to the one who sent me. That's what it is. And the one who sent me is the Father, and you have not seen him, nor heard his voice, nor does his word dwell in you, because if it did, if you had seen him, you would have seen me. Because Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you would have heard him, you would have known that the word I speak is his word and his truth to you. And if his word dwelt in your heart, you would know who I am and that I am the one that he sent. All of this is compacted into a few short verses of rebuke. And in 39, he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life, but these scriptures testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Let's get very clear about the word of God. 
We hold this to be sacred. We search this because in it we believe we will find the key to life. But the key to life is not words, it's not ideas, it's not concepts, and it's not doctrines. The key to life is not biblical history. The key to life is not anything that you can formulate out of this, not even doctrine. I'm sad to say that even theology is not the key to life, as much as I enjoy it. Hmm. I'm sad to say. Even theology is not the key to life as much as I enjoy it. We can spend our lives in this text or in our minds or in our minds in this text, but the text testifies of the one scent of God. And if you do not know that, if you do not hear that, if you do not see that, if you do not encounter that, if the one who is living, resurrected, spoken of here does not live in you, this will not be very meaningful to you. Everything is contingent upon you understanding when you open this book that these are the words that testify about him. He says it in the first person, that testify about me, that I am sent of the Father. Have I got your interest? So that is the starting point. When you hear things in this series coming up and you go, oh boy, Pastor Greg's on the edge of the cliff, know that I will never fall off because I am tethered by what I just told you. I am grounded and tethered in the idea that these scriptures speak not to an end in themselves. They aren't just words to help me walk down a path. They are living because the one who spoke them is living. These words reveal something. It's not a secret path. It's a living Savior. These words move us into relationships, not of intellectual connection, although that's fun too. But these words move us into a living connection with the living Christ, the source of all life. That is why we give them authority in our lives. That is why this book is worth searching. It's why this book has a life of its own. Oh, we can tear the book down, and we have. We can break it down, and we ought to. Oh, did you hear that? We ought to. I don't know if any of you have cable, but I was just spinning through the channels. My thumb is very skilled. I'm a great channel flipper. Any of you men good channel flippers? How many of you men can watch like 27 programs at the same time? Click, 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 click. And your wives say you can't multitask. I oh, come on. We're masterful multitaskers. We can drink a Coca-Cola or whatever and flip through 17 channels at the same time. Right on. We've got it. The men can multitask. Just kidding, of course. But I was flipping through the channels, and I saw one that that the, the information up above, it said Morgan Spurlock. Well, I like Morgan Spurlock because he did an expose on McDonald's called Super Size Me. Any of you see the film Super Size Me? Great film. Trust me, go rent it, Netflix it, whatever. You've got to see Super Size Me. And Morgan Spurlock does this this thing where he eats McDonald's for 30 days and documents what it does to his body and has medical tests and everything. It's very interesting. So he has this new thing called Seven Deadly Sins. I thought, well, that doesn't really interest me. But I listened for a couple of minutes, and you know what he was interviewing? Christian preachers who, through their study of the Word, are advocating for and or running houses of prostitution. So you had better break this down just a little bit. We need a reasonable faith. Do you get where I'm coming from? I'm not talking about the kind of reason that says, I can use reason to self-justify anything I want to justify. Because I can make this book say anything I want to say about it. And if you have any doubts about that, just listen to the theologies that emerge from this thing. 
we need a reasonable faith, an approach to studying this to save us from that kind of lunacy and self-contradiction. Pastors who claim to be pastors and Christian pastors at that, who use the same text I do, advocating for houses of prostitution or prostitution itself? God help us. Your gospel reading is your key. The scriptures testify about me, but you refuse to come to me to have life. That's where it's at. That is where I'm anchored. That is where I hope you're anchored. Our New Testament re uh, reading in 2 Timothy, if you still have that or if uh, the reference even is around. It says, warn them before God about quarreling about words. It's of no value and only ruins those who listen. We as a people spend a lot of time arguing about concepts and meanings that may not lead any of us to life. I'll spend more time on that in another sermon. Verse 15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Some texts say divides the word of truth. Pardon? Rightly divides, yes, the word of truth. Correctly handles it in this, this, uh, this particular translation. You see, how we live, how we divide the word and how we hear that in terms of small w, what is it of the law, what is it of the prophets, what is it of the gospels, what is it of the teachings that we allow to sink into us that move us down a path and in a way that's consistent with the teachings of Jesus. You see, if we know Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, we won't be tempted to read the scriptures the way some of the pastors do in Morgan Spurlock's Seven Deadly Sins, will we? It's, it's outrageous to even think because we know something about the path that's been given. We have a way of dividing truth from error. We have a way of looking at this that has meaning and context for our lives. You see, the, the Word isn't just something you study. It isn't just something you read. It isn't something, it's something you live. So when you live the small w word, it has to be consistent with living in and abiding in the capital W word. Let me break that out a little differently for you. What you believe and what you walk and what you teach and how you conduct yourself in business and in life must be indicative of a relationship that you carry with the source of all life, the word capital W, Jesus Christ. When those two come into alignment, you're good. Well, none of us are good. Only God is good. Jesus said that himself. But you're where you ought to be. That's what I mean by the phrase good. You're where you ought to be. Yeah. Anything else is distortion. The small w teaching must align with living in and through relationship with the divine, the person of Jesus Christ living in and through him. We've got to be careful about the claims we make either direction. Out of a relationship with Christ, we need to be careful how we use the word in relationship to the judgment of others, if we choose to even take that on at all. And out of the small w word, we need to be very careful that we're not elevating its importance in our ideas of what it means for our lives or our theories about what it says above the example that Jesus gave us in his daily life. We're living in service and self-sacrificing love. These are the keys. Have I lost you yet? Good. We're still together even at 1213. Wonderful. Our Old Testament passage, Nehemiah, is a fabulous story. I urge you to go home and read the story of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. 
they rediscovered in, in, in this the book of the law of God. They read making clear the meaning and giving the meaning so that people understood what was being read. Kind of what I try to do from Sabbath to Sabbath. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law, and all the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Don't mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. This lost text, this lost piece of covenant, this way of being connected to the God they had loved spoke to them so powerfully that they were weeping as they heard the ways in which they had lost sight of the God they had once loved. And they were drawn back to him in his word. They were drawn back to God through the law and through the word. And it was declared that day to be a Sabbath. No more weeping, let us celebrate. No more fasting, let us feast. This is a day to be happy and rejoice. For the word of God has been rediscovered. This is what happened that revived a people long ago. Our call to worship Psalm 1 speaks of law also. Those who delight in the law, who meditate on God's law day and night, this person is like a tree planted by streams of water, fruitful, green and verdant, prosperous. That's the image. When we drink deeply from the waters of life, when we plant ourselves in fertile soils, when we meditate on the goodness of God day and night, we're like that tree. It's a metaphor and image that we don't see often because we don't have streams of rotted water running anywhere in California right now. What's a stream? I think that's what Californians are saying right now. And a green tree? Most of our trees are kind of a dusty green, if you want to look at it. Hopefully we'll get some water and things will green up a bit. California used to be golden. It's just flat out now dull brown. Have you noticed that? The dull brown state, that's what it is, yeah. So um, we're not used to these images of verdancy, of vibrancy, of, of life, but the Scripture gives us these. Well, we're just getting to the warm-up here. I don't really have time to do the sermon I had planned today. But I hope that you can take this basic set of connections and plug them in to the idea of a reasonable faith. Because a reasonable faith is one that grounds us in the living God, in the God who reveals himself, in the God of Jesus Christ, in the one who came to speak words of life to you and to me. That's a reasonable faith. That is the core and essence of a reasonable faith. In time, in time, we're going to look at ways to look at Scripture, problems and strengths, ways to do justice to the study we engage, the ways in which our own tradition has spoken to this. And we're going to seek a path of freedom and a path of reason. But that's for another day. And until that day comes, may God strengthen you and bless you in his word, small w, as you study it and show yourself approved. And may he bless you and speak to you as you make your choice to live daily in the word, capital W, who was sent and who dwells among us. Amen.